Ah, let's go. Eyes up here. Um, I was, uh, actually, I spent almost my entire, uh, I almost said spring break, Christmas break, um, like super duper sick, like probably more sick than I've ever been in my entire life. Like I started kind of getting sick, like right before Christmas, like so my first day off. And then, um, I, yeah, I got, I just got really sick. I, and I can probably count on like one hand, the amount of times that I've been like sick, sick in my entire life. Um, but this was the worst and it wasn't COVID. I had like two or three tests. I don't know. It's all like all blur at this point. All the days just blended together, but I did like two or three COVID tests. It wasn't that it was actually influenza A, which is just the flu. And, um, I had a fever for like eight or 10 days or something in a row. And, um, I just didn't want to move. I went through like a million boxes the tissues and um, I was really bummed because there's a new Pokemon game coming out this month and I was like I really wish it came out last month so I could just like kill time doing that um, but yeah you know it, it didn't work out uh, and if you know me I like if you know me at all like I just like can't sit still at all um, and it, it just I went crazy and I just had to sit there with my dog who is also a lot like me and also like goes crazy and just um, as soon as I like move a muscle she's like oh you want to play let's go yeah let's go do everything um, but I kept thinking that I was getting better and then like a fever would creep right back and just slap me right in the mouth and then um, one day, actually, I like was starting to get better and then the fever came back and my fever got to like almost, I think it got to like 104 or something like that, which I'm not a doctor, but um, apparently that's bad. And then I experienced actually one of the, I was not exaggerating, one of the worst things that's ever happened to any human in all of history. And I had, Michaela made me take a cold bath, which like, I really don't know. I don't know if that's like good or bad or anything like that. Like I, you might be like, a doctor or something be like she shouldn't have done I don't know um but it was honestly it was probably like only like room temperature water but I had a fever and I was like freezing the entire time I just had to sit there and uh, oh my gosh it felt like Antarctica in the winter like I was I was dying and literally my my teeth were like like just, oh my gosh. And uh, it was, I think it was only like five minutes and my temperature went down to, I think it went down like four degrees. Like it went down like uh, to a hundred in just like a few minutes. So it was definitely helpful. Um, and whew, oh my gosh, it just was not fun. And also Michaela, like I, like I said, I've never been sick. I'd never been sick even like half that long. So apparently you're supposed to stay hydrated. So she kept giving me like water and Gatorade and like Pedialyte, which is like Gatorade on steroids and man it just like tastes like salt and uh, it's not good um and she also like also before we got married we're like we got married almost two years ago I never took medicine I'm like that's g killing my immune system I'm not a part of that ibuprofen or anything like that and she's just like hey you only slept two hours in the last three days maybe you should take some medicine or something like that and so I started doing that too and it was it was helpful I will admit that and uh I actually at one point, uh, I realized and I told Michaela, I am quite certain if I lived by myself at this point that I'd probably be dead. Like that might be dramatic. It might like actually, um, but I think that there's a chance. I think I may have just died of dehydration or um, like whatever fevers do. I don't really know what fevers do, but whatever. Um, anyway, the point is that I like needed help and I have like very real and obvious limitations and uh, it's really easy to tell. Sometimes I even like, I don't know if you guys have heard of shows like Survivor is not super intense, but there's one called, I think like Alone and you literally just like put people in the mid middle of the wilderness, see how long they can survive by themselves. And I watched that and I'm like, yeah, I would die. Like I, I wouldn't last like a second. And there's, there's a breed of people that like, hey, yeah, you make fun of the redneck until the apocalypse happens. And like, yeah, they can handle business. I am not one of those people. Um, and if you need proof that I need help in a lot of situations in life, it sounds strange, but actually I want to show you I don't really want to show you because it's really embarrassing, but it's a good example. Uh, my first couple profile pictures on Facebook, which was when I was like your guys' age, uh, my very first one, my friend Carl helped me set up my account and he literally just took a picture. It did, wasn't an app. It was literally on a desktop and um, he just took a picture and uploaded it to the computer and I have the picture. That's just Shane right next to his computer. And I, I had actually at that point in life, I have like a lot of hats now. I just had like one hat 
And if it didn't match with what I was wearing, doesn't matter. I'm wearing that hat everywhere. I'm wearing it to church. I'm wearing it to, I'm wearing it in the pool. I'm wearing the hat everywhere. And that was that hat at the time. It had uh, really cool flames on it. So, and also my friend Carl, we were like really tight at the time. I uh, just took the next, my next profile picture at a wedding and that's it. And I don't know what that guy was doing in the background. He's just like chilling. Um, but Man, even I remember, I seriously remember, I was like your guys' age. I was, I was really stupid. Um, I saw that picture and I was like, yo, I look good in that. Like, I, and I, oh my gosh. Um, hey, shout out to whoever has my back and said that I did. But apparently I didn't have friends in this stage of life, like good friends who would tell me like, hey, Shane, you, this is bad. Uh, you, need, you need help. You need to not do that. Um, but making, making good decisions is clearly something I've needed help with in life. And if you need more examples. Uh, seriously, my Facebook page is, is public, and I've never deleted a picture, and I regret that. So uh, you, can, you can look at a lot of it. Nathan, do we have a question? I had Justin Bieber hair, yeah, and it's ironic because I like Justin Bieber now, but I did not like him then, uh, so go figure, but whatever. Um, imagine, though, imagine, I, let me put that last picture back up. Imagine if the glory of God being spread to the ends of the earth hinged on the ability or the success or the power of this person. Like, imagine if, if God being spread to the ends of the earth, if God's plan in the earth hinged on, on that. Like, could you imagine? Like, we'd be in terrible hands. But clearly, I need help. I need a lot of help. And I certainly need God. But tonight, we, listen, tonight we are continuing a series that we are calling Big God. Can you say that after me? Big God? Big God. Say it after me. Big God. There we go. We're catching up. All right. We are looking at stories in the Bible that are crazy. They're awesome. They're amazing. I love all of these stories that I've actually picked each of them out. But the cool thing is that they're completely true. And we're going through even just a different book in the Bible just to get a different perspective on each. And uh, through each of these stories, we're discovering actually something that God reveals about himself, just like one trait in each. And I think it's really cool that he does this in stories because God, God could reveal himself in any efficient way possible. But he knows how he made us. He knows how he wired us. And he knows that stories really connect to our minds and to our hearts. And especially with people involved. Like you can put yourself in the shoes of people in these stories. And literally every story that takes place in the Bible happens on earth. So you can literally go there right now, anything that happened in the Bible. I think that's amazing. And God connects what we need to know about him through these stories in the Bible. And we've talked through, uh, we've gone through three weeks so far. We've talked through the 10 plagues. We've talked through uh, Gideon and like his army that got smaller. And then last week we talked about uh, Ezekiel and a valley of dry bones that God literally gave life to. Um, does anybody, zero pressure, but if, does anybody remember any of the traits that we've discovered about God through these three stories so far? We've, we've just looked at one trait each of the weeks. And does anybody have, uh, have a guess or, or remember those? Amelia has one. God is omnipotent, yeah, omnipotent, all-powerful. Absolutely, great job. All-powerful God has all power in his hands. Braden has one. God is just, great. Yeah, that was the first one. The 10 plagues in Egypt, God could not let evil go unnoticed. He had to address it because he's just. Andrew, you have, what, did he take yours? What's the last one? God is faithful. Great job. Even when he made Gideon's army smaller, he was still faithful to deliver. It's really cool. Um, tonight, we are going to look and discover that God is self-sufficient. Self-sufficient. Um, anybody, when you see the words, or I guess that's one word hyphenated. I don't know. Is Spider-Man one word? Self-sufficient is, uh, what do you think that means? I'm not looking for a correct answer. I'm not going to tell you. What do you think self-sufficient means? When you see that, you're like, I think it means this. Caden? Okay, yeah, um, kind of um, independent a little bit on your own. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else? Yeah, Braden. You can live off of sorry. You can live off of what you need. Okay, so you're kind of like a uh, minimal kind of somebody like on alone. Like I can get by on just the. Okay, cool, Andrew. 
Yeah, that, I think that's perfect. Um, I think everybody, but that, that's, yeah, this is very helpful. That describes somebody that's self-sufficient, and I think that really defines it. What I had is um, needing no outside help and satisfying one's basic needs, like emotionally and, um, um, and intellectually independent, much like what Caden said. Um, it's basically not needing anything outside of yourself. And uh, we, we, sometimes we will describe people this way, but no human really is self-sufficient. Um, it, it can be like more to an extent of other people, but um, more more so like people on those shows and stuff like that are resourceful. They're very like, hey, what is provided to them? They capitalize on it, but they're not self-sufficient. They don't have everything that they need inside of themselves because they don't have food. They don't have water. Something has to be provided, even if it's the smallest thing possible. Um, no human being is that. And uh, I want to look, though, that we are going to look at a story and see how God proves that he is um, self-sufficient. And if you learn one thing tonight, I want to, eyes up here, um, I, if you want learn one thing tonight, I want it to be this. It is that God is not restricted by our categories or categories might like maybe our understanding or how we can explain God. God is not restricted to just how we can explain him or just how we can understand him, nor does he really need us. He just chooses to love us and use us. He is self-sufficient. And God shows this, um, this about himself, that he is self-sufficient um, in Joshua chapter 10. Um, go ahead and turn with me there, eyes up here. Go ahead and turn with me to the book of Joshua. If you brought your Bible or a Bible app also works, but I really do implore you you to bring a physical copy of God's word uh, because that is yours. Nobody can take that from you. You won't get a text on a, on a physical copy of the Bible that will distract you or anything like that. Um, but bring your Bibles, Joshua chapter 6, or Joshua chapter 10, I mean. Joshua is the sixth book in the Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, tell me, tell a leader, tell anyone, we want to buy you one. Or you can literally like borrow one on top of the soda cooler over there and use it for tonight. But Joshua chapter 10, um, Joshua, I think, is a cool book. It's kind of just like a big, long war story. Um, does anybody like war movies just by a show of hands? I want, I, okay, I, I super love war movies. It's kind of like a small genre. Um, but yeah, yeah, a lot of people. Love, okay, um, you have like We Were Soldiers is great. You have um, uh, Saving Private Ryan, which is like super intense. These are all actually like rated R and like super gory and stuff. So I'm not recommending it. Um, but also like, listen, listen. The, uh, I think the most recent one was 1917, and man, it's like shot like it's not actually, but it looks like it's just one continuous shot the entire movie, like it never cuts. Um, it's pretty amazing, but whatever. I like that movie a lot. But this, this book of Joshua is of God's people basically conquering everything before them. It's a bunch of war stories, and no matter how insurmountable, no matter how unlikely, no matter how huge or impossible, they just keep defeating these enemies. Like if you've ever heard of the story of the, like Jericho, Jericho falling down that huge city. This is in Joshua. They just march around a city and the walls fall down. A bunch of like just huge, awesome things. And something that's important to notice, it may not seem important, but something that's important to notice in the book of Joshua is that everybody, Joshua is leading God's people. And everybody that Joshua is leading um, at this point has actually always been stuck in the middle of the wilderness, in the middle of the desert their entire lives. Because God made this promise. Um, after God, we talked about a few weeks ago, after God led his people out of Egypt, freed them from slavery, they just kept disobeying him, kept spitting in God's face, and God promised them. He said, you and your entire generation are never going to see the land that I've promised you. You're going to wander around for 40 years and you, nobody in your people is going to enter the promised land until all of you have died out. And that's what we see. The entire next generation, like all of them had kids and their kids have just grown up in the wilderness and they are the ones who enter the promised land. And I think that's important to point out because they have literally been, been absolutely outside of their own decision, having to lean on God their entire life for everything. They have no, no source of food without God. They have no source of water without God directly providing it. He literally makes bread show up every morning and then, and then birds so they could eat. The, like they, he literally keeps providing their basic necessities every single day. And I would argue that this is the reason that God's people are so successful in this book. 
because they had no other choice than to depend on God. And they are forced to depend on God for all that they need. And I think we have a lot to learn from that. Um, one of my favorite authors or just like Christian pastors is named uh, Tim Keller. He's like Christian Yoda. He just like spits out wisdom. Like it's just, it's a second language. And he says, um, as many have learned or later taught, you don't realize Jesus is all that you need until Jesus is all that you have. Like you don't realize how much you need to lean on Jesus for everything in life until you really have no other options. Um, and these people were constantly met with situations where they knew they, were, they would be defeated or, or even like die in battle if God was not there beside them and with them. They needed God. And there's this phrase repeated all throughout Joshua. It's God telling his people, be strong and courageous. And he keeps repeating this to his people. He says, be strong and courageous. He even says, be strong and very courageous. But how can they live life being strong and filled with courage? They can do that because they know that God is enough. That's all they've known their entire lives. If God is there and they are there with him, nothing can get in God's way, not even a little bit. In God's plan, I always think of it, especially as revealed in Joshua, it's like a train, like it's going 100 miles per hour and the, the biggest obstacle that we can put in front of this train is like a rock that fits in your pocket and you put it on and it just gets obliterated. Like you can't stop a train with something that small. And w this is what we see. Um, in Joshua chapter 10, you actually have uh, a bunch of allies of Joshua and like God's people are getting like bombarded and attacked and ambushed by five armies all at once. And obviously they're losing and they're allies of Joshua. So they call out and they're like, yo, we need help. We need reinforcements. We're about to die. Can you send your people ASAP? And that's exactly what Joshua does. Joshua chapter 10, verse 6. Um, and the men of Gibeon, those are his allies, sent to Joshua at the camp, said, um, do not relax your hand from your servants. He says, now is not the time to chill. We need help. Come to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered up against us. So verse 7, Joshua went up there and he and all of his people of war went with him. Literally wasted no time. He said, soldiers, you guys ready? We're, we're out of here. And he went and he helped. And then in verse eight, man, this is the biggest verse that we're gonna read. The Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Verse nine, so Joshua came to them suddenly. He marched all through the night and, and the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel and the army and struck a great blow at that city of Gibeon and chased them by the way of a bunch of uh, cities that I can't pronounce. But basically this is saying that they just keep pushing them further back and back and they keep having to retreat. And then verse 11, and they fled before Israel and they went down even further to a place that starts with a B and the Lord threw even large stones from heaven on them as far as um, Azekah and they died. And there were actually more who died from these hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Basically more died from those hailstones than of anybody fighting in battle. And then verse 12, and at that time, this is the crazy part. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord as the bad guys were, were retreating. And he, he said to the Lord while it was still daylight, um, he said, son, stand still at Gibeon. And, and the moon in the valley of whatever. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. The sun stopped and the moon just stopped. Is this not written in the book of Jashar, which would be like a historical book for them? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. Verse 14, there has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of man for the Lord fought for Israel. I think that's wild. Like, did you guys know that like the just sun stopped moving in the Bible? Um, Joshua literally asked God to keep the sun from going down so that the enemy like couldn't retreat and stall them out and then go scatter somewhere else. And God stopped the sun. And not only that, but he made, uh, he made them panic and he made giant hailstones fall on them to defeat the enemy even more quickly. It's wild. And a lot of people have actually done research on this. They're like, it could have been like the slowing of the earth's rotation. It could have been tilting of the earth's axis. Um, it literally could have just been like the sun went down, but God provided more light and the author didn't know what else to write. Like it seemed like the sun just stayed up for another day. Um, but we just know, we don't really know 
We just know where the author things happen, which is the sun stayed up. But we do know, according that to this writer, it sure seemed like the sun stayed where it was for like 24 hours. And one thing is made clear. God is not restricted by what we can conjure up or understand or categorize. God is not restricted by a 24-hour day, nor does he need us. He, he is the one, I don't know if you noticed, he is the one that when Joshua and the army showed up, made everybody just panic, even though they outnumbered them five armies to one army. He is the one that put them in a panic. He is the one who also, and the verse points out very purposefully, that God's hailstones caused a lot more damage than any of the soldiers did. And God is the one who literally made the sun and the moon stop. And uh, whew, there's one verse that really sums up this entire story, and I mentioned it. It's verse 8. I want to read that again. The Lord said to Joshua, before any of this happened, just while they were approaching, do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. He says, don't fear them. I have given them into your hands. Not a single one of them will stand before you. And it would be rational for, for Joshua to hear that. And, and to really believe it for a moment and then to fight in battle and then start to see the sun go down and see the enemy retreating and be like, well, I guess I didn't really understand what God was saying or I guess, I guess uh, he didn't really mean what he said. I guess maybe he meant it more as like a metaphor or something, but no, that's not, that's not what happens. Joshua said, if God made a promise, it will come true. I don't really know how. I just know that God made a promise and it will come true. His promise is more sure than the sun coming up tomorrow morning. He does not need me in order for his promise to be fulfilled. So I will do what he's told me knowing that the outcome is secure. This is like a really bad explanation, but there's nothing that we can really compare it to. So I just came up with something stupid. It's like if I told, uh, if I told Chase Irvin, everybody say, hi, Chase. Chase is what, part of the winning group of our game tonight, so congratulations to Chase. It's like if I told Chase, it's like 731 right now, if I told Chase um, at exactly 847 tonight, somebody's going to throw an Oreo and hit you in the head, and there's nothing you can do about it. Like, I'm from, I'm from a, two hours in the future or whatever, and that's going to happen. Like, you can do, you can, Chase can do whatever he wants the rest of the night. He can go home. He can literally put his head in, in bubble wrap. He can hide in his closet, do whatever he wants to do, but... One thing is for sure, that is going to happen. I don't, how is that going to happen? I have no idea. Um, no matter what you do, you're sure that that will happen. And even to quote Thanos, because I always have to do something, run from it, dread from it, destiny still arises. It's still going to happen. Um, even, even to a greater extent, we never question if the sun will come up tomorrow morning, right? Like that's never like, even when COVID broke the world and you're like, am I going to go to school? How's life? You never question, is the sun going to come up tomorrow? But I can literally Google right now. I actually did this earlier when the sunset is going to happen in October. Like that's how predictable it is. This always happens. There's nothing we can do to alter or change that. It's not in my power. Yet God's promises are are more sure than that. Hear me, God's promises transcend what we can imagine or understand about how sure they are. Why I think about it, his plan does not hinge on anything or anyone. God does not need help to make his plan happen. He is self-sufficient. He said, don't fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a single one will stand against you. I wanna see that first thing that he said. He said, don't fear them. Joshua and his people had every single reason to fear. He was going in to an ambush and people were getting attacked and they really had no, no means to be there and, like, and actually think that they could win. Um, they could not see everything that God had planned. And even after they heard this promise in verse 8 from God, it sure did not seem like what God said was going to come true. Like he was like, I know God said this, but I'm here right now and it sure doesn't seem like that's going to happen. The sun was going down. The people were retreating and going to escape. It was, it was impossible to chase them through the night. God's promise was not coming true. Yet we're left with a, a very similar question to the people right here. Why is God worth trusting? Like if I see the sun going down, if I see the people retreating, if I see his promise not happening, why is it worth trusting in God? If I can't see how everything works out, what reason do I have to trust him? And even more so than that, what reason do I have to put my life on the line? The answer is here, is that God is self-sufficient. 
He said, don't fear them. And actually a man named David, who, um, who the same guy, David and Goliath, wrote a psalm, which is like poetic imagery. And you're really supposed to think about what, it, what it's picturing. And he, he says, listen closely to what he says about God's word to us. God explaining things to us. He says in Psalm 119, he says, your word, that's very intentional. Your word, God, if you tell me something, it's like a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. I know you guys know how lamps work. Picture actually, I always picture like one of those handheld ones like they have in like Middle Earth or Lord of the Rings or whatever. And it's like, it's like cranky back and forth. It makes a noise or whatever. And, and it, it, it has like glass around. You guys know what I'm talking about. I picture one of those and complete, c- picture you're holding one of those in like complete darkness. And wh- what can you see when you're holding a lamp like that? And it's complete darkness. You can really just see the next step. Nothing more, nothing less. You can see what's there. Nothing more, nothing less. And uh, this is how God's word is described to us. Does the Bible tell us 100% of everything there is to know about God? No, absolutely not. That, that'd be impossible. Literally, Isaiah 55 tells us that God, God is like heaven compared to earth. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. Like literally the smartest person in the world, the most creative person in the world can't touch how creative God is. His ways are greater than our ways. And also Philippians 4 says God provides us peace and that peace provi- transcends everything that we can understand. God's peace is so great that we can't even wrap our minds around it. And God shows us everything we need to follow him. Not everything. We don't know everything about God. God knows what we need to know about him and provides that to us. What's necessary to take the next step. Joshua and all of his people knew that they needed God. They also also knew that God was all that they need. And, and they knew that God needed nothing more than himself to carry out his plan. And that's why he's worth trusting in. The second part of that statement, he said, do not fear them for I have given them into your hand. We have a lot of Bengals and Chiefs fans in this room. Um, who all watch, I, it's okay if not, I'll explain it. But who all watched the Chiefs and Bills game? This past, Oh my gosh, it was wild. I think I actually like, maybe only watch the fourth quarter and overtime, spoiler, but um, it, w- it was wild. It's probably one of the craziest, like, just games, like, of sports that I've ever seen in my entire life. It just, like, kept going. Like, I think the lead changed, like, five times in the last minute and a half or whatever, um, but the Chiefs, uh, if you were watching or not, the Chiefs were down three points, and they had 13 seconds at, like, their own 20-yard line to go down the field and then, like, try to kick a field goal. 13 seconds is all that they have. And we all know Patrick Mahomes. He sounds like Kermit the Frog. We love Patrick Mahomes. He's super awesome. And uh, the, his coach, his name, Andy Reid, Andy Reid told Patrick Mahomes one of the coolest things I've ever heard in my entire life. Uh, I, I have a picture of a, a tweet of somebody that uh, said what Andy Reid said to him. He said, he said, with your season on the line, if, if, you, if this doesn't work, if you don't show out, you're done for the next several months. Your season's done. No Super Bowl shot. He said, when it's grim, be the grim reaper. That's one of the most gangster things I've ever heard in my entire life. He was like, yo, this should not work and it probably won't. But if you want this to work, when it's grim, be the grim reaper. And this is, I think, I think this is actually, I just read this today and it reminded me of what God is saying here. He said, for I have given them into your plan or into your hands. Uh, This is such a baller statement from God. I don't know if you realize that. Like he, he doesn't say, he doesn't say I'm going to give them into your hands. Nothing has happened yet. He said, hey, it's already happened. I have given them into your plans or into your hands. I keep saying plans. Uh, God says, I'm with you. You're with me. And that is enough to be absolutely certain of the outcome. When, when God makes a promise, it's as if it already happened. I really want you to hear that. When God makes a promise, and his promises in the Bible are saying to us, um, when God makes a promise, it's as if it already took place. And this is what God addressing is a huge question. And the book, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes actually tells us that every single person that has ever existed asks this question. What happens when I die? How can I be sure that God will deliver me from the consequences of my sin when it's all said and done. Because at that point, it's too late to be wrong, right? How can I be sure that God honestly will save me from hell and deliver me to heaven? How? 
How can I be sure of that? This statement right here is the answer to that because this is the same God then as it is today. He said, I have given them into your, plan, into your hands. He's saying, if, if you put your faith in me, and today if we put our faith in Jesus, you can be more sure of heaven than you, will, than you are that the sun's gonna come up tomorrow morning. Th- this is what we see about our God. He has given it into our hands. And Paul, Paul, messed up dude. He wrote like more than half of the New Testament, I think. Um, He had a terrible life before following God and then became one of the most like passionate about telling people about Jesus in his entire life. Paul, he likely wrestled with the same question. I don't know if we see him as a person, but he likely wrestled with the same question. He said, I'm going through constantly almost dying like every day. There's literally a list in the Bible where he says, I almost died this way, a shipwreck. I almost got, I almost did all these things. And he's probably wrestling constantly thinking, how can I be sure that God has got me? How can I be sure that God is all that I need? How can I be sure that I am secure in God and he, that he really is enough? And then he writes uh, Romans chapter eight. He said, I am convinced that neither death nor life I'm convinced that not angels or or demons, neither the present, the future, or any power that exists, not the highest of highs, not the lowest of lows, not anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul, Paul literally says, I am more certain of of a promise that God made to me, of the promise from Jesus that he saved me from my sins than I am that I will one day die. He's saying I'm more sure than anything of God's promise. When God makes a promise, it's as if it already happened. And then the last part of that that statement from God, he said, um, he said, do not fear them for I have given them into your hands and not a man of them shall stand before you. We can be sure of God's plan. We can be more sure of God's plan coming true than we can of anything. Like I said earlier, it's like a train going 100 miles per hour. Nothing on earth exists powerful enough to slow it down. Not even something as sure as the sun setting. And I love the last verse that we read in this story in Joshua uh, 10, 14. It says, there has not been a day like it before or since. Like nothing like that. The sun standing still, that happened one time and it never happened before and it never happened after. It's crazy. Like, it, it's not like we, we just didn't record it in the Bible. We can be sure that that never happened again. Notice, though, that Joshua, who likely wrote this, I'm not sure, um, was only able to say this after God made a promise to him and he put his complete life and trust in his hands. And something happened that was by all human capability, by all human measurement, by all human understanding, it could not happen. It was impossible. And this is actually why, um, why science will often claim or even prove, prove that God cannot or does not exist. Um, the, the, the system of science is not set up to account for God. Science hasn't caught up to God. Um, I know you guys know, who all has learned the scientific method in school yet? I don't know if that's happened yet. I don't know if that's a high school thing. Okay, some of us have. Um, It's basically how you can test if something is true according to science. Um, The scientific method claims that something can only be true if it is measurable and repeatable. Yet we just read here in, in 1014 of Joshua that something happened that never happened before or never happened after. How do you account for that? This verse just made it clear. God regularly does things that can't be repeated because he is the only self-sufficient being to ever exist. He, He does things that can't be repeated without his hand intervening. And as far as we can measure, it can't happen. Yet God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need help outside of himself. And, and God is not restricted by how we can explain him, understand him, categorize him, and he does not need us. Thank goodness for that. I, sometimes I say that God doesn't need me and it's like, oh, then what use do I have? No, thank the Lord that he does not need me, right? Like you guys saw my profile picture in sixth grade. Thank the Lord that he does not need me to carry out his will because if he did, we'd be in huge trouble. But God is enough. If God needed my help to save me, man, I would be lost. 
but God is enough and he chooses to use my faith to save me. So, so what do we do with this? In, in Matthew chapter 16, there's actually, it's not unrelated. All the Bible works together on purpose. Um, Jesus is hanging out in Matthew 16 with some of his friends and his followers, his disciples. And they're actually all just like talking about stuff. And they're actually listing out a lot of what people think about Jesus. Um, they're like, hey, some people think that you're like John the Baptist. Some people think you're like Elijah. Some people think that you're like a genie that like, if you pray, you give them stuff. And some people think that you don't care about us. Like some people think that God just sees us, doesn't care. Some people think that God is not real at all. Like they're having this conversation and Jesus is hearing all of this. And they're like, yeah, I, I, I've heard some people say that. I've heard other camps say that. I've heard, um, I've heard Lutherans say that. I've heard, uh, I've heard Muslims say this about God. I've heard, I've heard all of this. And Jesus is listening, but he, he looks his disciples in the eye and says, I hear all that. I understand all that. What do you say about who I am? This is the God of the universe saying this. He says, okay, I hear what everybody has told you. What do you say about who God is? What, what do you have to say? And I imagine it took a second for them to think about it and sink in. But uh, there's, there's one, one guy in Jesus' group of disciples who is clearly the extrovert, Peter. And he speaks up first and he says, uh, you are who you've shown us that you are. You are our savior. You are our Lord. You are what you have said is more true and more sure than the sun coming up. And I imagine, I imagine Jesus may have, I don't know, in that moment just smiled and took a second. And then in verse 18 of Matthew 16, he says, I tell you, Peter, in response to responding to who he says that God is. He says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Like, I'm going to do this, and you can think of the most powerful thing in the entire world, and even that can't stop this. And I read this because it's a lot like Joshua 10.8 that, we, that we've been reading. Jesus makes a promise. And when, when God of the universe makes a promise, it's as if it has already come true. And we have actually record of this one, this promise that Jesus made to Peter. We have record in the Bible of it coming true. Acts chapter two, this is exactly what happens. Peter is tasked with preaching to a group of thousands of people. And he does so, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with God's power in him. And 3,000 people in one moment begin following Jesus and the church starts that day. That's the promise fulfilled. He said, Peter, from you, I'm going to build the church. That's exactly what happened, actually just like a couple months later. And when Peter preached this sermon, when he stood up, it was like he was walking in darkness with a lamp. Like he had no idea that 3,000 people were going to get saved. He had no idea that people weren't going to stone him when he did that. That was more likely. But he was, he was walking in darkness with a lamp and he said, I know what my next step needs to be. And it's this, he had no idea what came next, but he knew what God had revealed and took that step. And Jesus, Jesus fulfilled, the prom, fulfilled his promise and the church as we know it today started from Peter. Or God, God made a promise to Peter and nothing has ever happened like that before or since. It cannot be explained or measured and the reason I think that Jesus says a lot, there's a lot of controversy about why Jesus says on this rock, I will build my church. I think it's, I think it's really on purpose and obvious. Um, think about like a boulder. What does a boulder do? It sits there and it does not budge from where it is. It's like uh, even like I compare it to the parable of like Jesus saying, build your house on the sand or on the rock. Which one's going to work out better? The one that's on the rock. It doesn't move. And God is saying, Jesus is saying here, put all of your weight on me because I am all that you need. Because Jesus is saying to us, I have no needs. I need nothing. If, if, some, if I have to count on somebody else and they fall through, then I'm not self-sufficient. But God is all that he needs to carry out his plan. God is self-sufficient. And I want to ask, have you ever had a moment like Peter or Joshua 
where your life was just like inexplicably changed. Like it can't be measured. It may not be, you may not be able to explain it super well without saying that God just made something happen that's never happened before or since. That God performed a miracle in your life. Because that's what, that's what salvation is. Have you done that? Have you had that moment of completely trusting God with your life? Much like the people in Joshua, they, they, that's all they knew. Have you had that moment where you've had to trust in God and you've completely trusted in him and you have not been the same since? The reason that we are here, the reason that all of us are here is, is, is to consider that. Really, we're wasting our time if, if we don't each consider that. Has, has that happened? Joshua experienced a life changed by the promise of God. And this is what he said, uh, probably one of the most, this is probably like the big, big, uh, big verse of Joshua that it all um, comes up to. And it's Joshua chapter four, verse 15. Joshua is saying, after going through all of these, all these battles, completely trusting on God the entire time, facing impossible situations, he gets to Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And he says, if serving this Lord, who, who is self-sufficient, seems undesirable to you. If that's not something that you want to do, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, me and my people, we're going to serve this God. The translation there is you do you. Really, God reveals himself to us. You do you. But this is what I'm doing because God is all that I need. Let's pray.